an honour to be here to present to you today about cultural sociology yesterday, today and tomorrow. The reason why I wanted to talk to you about the history, current state and future of cultural sociology is this. Cultural sociology as a distinct entity that calls itself cultural sociology has been in existence for about 15 years now. And so it's time, I think, to take stock, to see how things have developed, to see where they are now, to see how they could and should develop in the future. What I'm going to present to you is a very boiled down version of a book that I'm writing that will be published with SAGE next year. And the book is essentially a history of the field to set out its main tendencies and trajectories. So in the book proposal, of course, for you, write down what you're going to cover in the book. I told the publisher I would set out the history, set out what happens today, and at the end I would have a chapter called Critique and Appraisal. And basically what Critique and Appraisal is that at that point in the book I have a moan. I moan about stuff that I don't like. And that's what I'm going to do today. I am going to set out the field, I'm going to show how it's developed and how it's developing, and then I'm going to basically have a go at my own field. I'm going to do some learning because I think that there's some stuff wrong with it, as long as a lot of stuff right with it, and that's where I'm headed to show you what I think could be very much improved about the state of cultural sociology in the present day. So the structure of today's offering is that I'm going to consider how the field has developed, what its major dimensions are, what's wrong with them, according to each of the major schools, because there are a number of major schools of thought, and they all, in some ways, bitterly criticise each other. And in some ways, that's useful, because that's how further knowledge is created and new ideas produced. But some of the critiques that people throw at each other are not necessarily very helpful. And I'm going to consider that towards the end. I'm going to consider where the field is now and what needs to happen next in order to progress it to the next stage. What should we be doing, in my view, for the next 15 years? We live in the post poor Jew age. It is an age of uncertainty in the field of cultural sociology. Where Jew is dead, he died, as you know, 10 years ago, he still is the dominant figure in the field of cultural sociology, but yet it remains unclear what or who is replacing him in the field. So the question really that animates everything I'm saying today is what next? What happens after Bourdieu? What will happen in a post bourgeoisian epoch? And what will or should remain of his legacy? Because of course it's a huge legacy. Bourdieu's sociology as a project was quite extraordinary in my view because it was so all-encompassing, pulling in so many different theoretical and methodological dimensions and pulling in so many different aspects of modern social life. So at the moment, in the field of cultural sociology, many of the critiques that are being made of Bourdieu are highly negative and are trying to, in some senses, erase all trace of Bourdieu from the field. But my question is, well, what will remain of Bourdieu's legacy and what should remain? And I think that there's quite a lot of Bourdieu that should be retained. What are the ramifications of Bourdieu being criticised or retained for the field, is my other question. And, in order to make this, I hope, a little more interesting for people who don't work in the field, what are the ramifications of the post bourgeoisian period for other fields of sociology? Because it is the case that the kinds of ideas and concepts and approaches that get developed in the field of cultural, cultural sociology can and do spread to other fields. And I would like, perhaps, in the question period, to discuss with you what may be happening in cultural sociology that could or should transform other areas of sociology as a discipline. So cultural sociology institutionally is quite extraordinarily expansive and has been for the last 15 years or so. 
many of the most important national academic fields for sociology as practiced now have cultural sociology or something like it as a major dimension of sociology. That was not the case even just 20 years ago. There has been an extraordinary expansion of cultural sociology or something very much like it in national sociological fields including the US, Canada, the UK, Australasia, France, Germany, Italy, Russia and many others. So there's been an enormous international spread of this thing called cultural sociology. It's also the case that there are a whole range of scholarly organisations that are involved in uh, producing cultural sociology. There is important cultural sociological work done in the American Sociological Association, the British Sociological Association, the Association, the European Sociological Association, and various others as well. So more and more there are both national and international networks in this ever increasing field. Some of the most major practitioners in all forms of sociology across the world describe themselves or can be described as cultural sociologists. So for example, some of the major figures in American sociology such as Jeffrey Alexander, Michel Lemont and Paul DiMaggio are all leaders in the field of sociology generally and describe themselves in one way or another as cultural sociologists or sociologists of culture. So some of the field's leaders in general sociology are cultural sociologists. Uh, we could add a whole pile of names in other national contexts. Uh, Mike Savage and Alan Ward in the UK, uh, Bernard Laia in France, and a whole range of other people. I think it's important before I begin to set out the development and current state of play in the field to pose the question, well, what precisely do I mean by cultural sociology? What is it? And it is the case that certain different kinds of people have certain different kinds of definitions of what it is. To write the book, I did a search to see when I could find the first published mention of the phrase cultural sociology. And the first published mention of the phrase that I could find was an American article from the mid-1930s by an otherwise forgotten American author. The question posed in that paper was, could, can there be a cultural sociology? And the answer turned out to be no. So that wasn't particularly promising, um, and it took another 40 to 50 years for cultural sociology as a phrase and as an institution to make a real bona fide appearance. Many times when I'm talking to people and they say, oh yeah, you're the guy that edits cultural studies, I of course, you know, I, you know I'm taken aback and I go, no, 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 not cultural studies, cultural sociology. And so to the to those who are not interested particularly in such things, the difference between cultural sociology and cultural studies would seem to be not very important at all. But for those of us who work in cultural sociology, the difference is crucial because in certain senses, our relations to cultural studies define what we are by defining what we are not. It is certainly the case that there have been some overlaps historically between cultural sociology and cultural studies. For example, the work of the Birmingham School on youth cultures informs both domains of knowledge. And there are some overlaps, at least in potential now. In recent papers, the British sociologist Gregor McLennan has said that never before has there been such a potentially rich period in which cultural sociology and cultural studies can learn from each other and live in a situation of positive symbiosis. Why? Because he says that both sociology in general and cultural studies today do and can draw upon a shared legacy of what he calls social and cultural theory. In other words, today sociologists don't just pull on sociological theory, they pull on, they pull on and use more general social and cultural theory, including theory that comes from the humanities. Nonetheless, although there have been and could be overlaps between cultural sociology and cultural studies, they have very different institutionalizations and very different intellectual emphases. There are some shared things, but a lot of great differences as well. In terms of different institutionalizations, cultural studies in the US tends to happen in literature departments or other kinds of humanities departments, whereas cultural sociology always happens in sociology departments. 
Likewise, in the United Kingdom, cultural studies very much tends to be located in humanities departments, often in former polytechnic universities, whereas cultural sociology is practiced in site sociology departments, generally within the older established institutions. So they have very different institutional bases, and they have different intellectual emphases. I think that we could certainly say that the self-understanding of people in cultural studies is that it is a unique entity and enterprise. Why? Because many people in cultural studies define that field as a peculiarly interdisciplinary discipline. Cultural studies is presented in programmatic statements and in textbooks as a unique thing because it draws upon bits and pieces from all sorts of disciplines. Cultural studies is quite self-consciously an assemblage of different things. Things such as literary studies, some sociology, anthropology, semiotics, philosophy, and some other stuff. It would certainly be justifiable to say today that the key concerns of cultural studies are as follows. If you're reading cultural studies, then what you're probably reading are academic works that are, in effect, celebrations of popular culture, attempts to show the value and worth of popular cultural forms that, from a high cultural point of view, are stupid or trashy. So cultural studies is very much about recuperating the cultural value in soap operas, teenage magazines, Madonna lyrics, and so on and so forth. It's also the case that cultural studies is very much concerned with relationships between what cultural studies people call texts and forms of social power. So a classic cultural studies approach would be to look at some kind of cultural text, let's say a particular kind of music or uh, a TV show aimed at teenagers, and find forms of social power in the text, either hegemonic forms of social power or forms of resistance to hegemonic forms of social power. So that's cultural studies in effect. There are national variations. The American version of cultural studies is very much more literary and text-based, whereas British cultural studies is an amalgam, more of that kind of stuff that the Americans do, and also more ethnographic elements to do with the study of, in particular, youth cultures. But it's there in the British version of cultural studies that the greatest overlap with cultural sociology is. So if you're doing cultural studies, the key methods that are deployed are the analysis of mass media texts, seeing how those texts express forms of power in often hidden ways. Really, in effect, I think that cultural studies is in large part um, riffing on Roland Bat and mythologies, where you look at particular texts to decode the power relations in them. And sometimes cultural studies is also involving analysis of media audiences, especially in terms of celebrating what cultural studies call the scholars see as the resistive capacities of media audiences. It is one of the fundamental beliefs of cultural studies that audiences of popular culture are not dupes, are not puppets, are not simply taken in by power, but have the capacity to resist and turn power against itself. People are not the brainwashed masses, they are creative, active audiences. So the kind of key thinkers that cultural studies would draw upon would include these. Raymond Williams on texts and audiences, Bart on texts, Gramsci on audiences, Stuart Hall on texts and audiences, Derrida on texts, Foucault on texts, Edward Said on texts, and Michel Desserteau on the resistive and allegedly creative aspects of ordinary people when they are in mass media audiences. So probably the way that cultural studies has gone could be described in this way. A classic form of cultural studies of the present time is fan studies. Fan studies is a form of engaged scholarship because what it is is ranged against academic and high culture stereotypes about fans. The kind of folk that you see there are not to be regarded as stupid, they're not to be despised. These are creative folk exercising all sorts of interesting forms of agency. Fans on this view make up interpretive communities, and those interpretive communities, to quote one major practitioner of fan studies, are social, engaged, empowered, and creative. In other words, fans are really clever. 
This kind of cultural studies is very much post-Gramscian and post-structuralist. It has a post-Gramscian and post-structuralist conception of power, whereby power is not rigid but fluid, power is always contestable, power is always on the move and can be resisted in many different ways. So, from this point of view, fans are textual poachers. They watch their favourite TV shows, they watch their favourite films, and make of those films or TV shows or whatever something new and something creative. They create new forms of culture by engaging with the stuff that they love. Thus, fans are cultural producers. They create their own fan cultures, they create their own life worlds. Above all, they exercise agency to create new cultural possibilities. That means, according to this perspective, that fans have power read the cultural industries. It, it's the capacity of fans, for example, who are very, very unhappy when their show is cancelled, to lobby TV executives and the show gets back on the air again. And very much this kind of cultural studies connects fans and identity politics. It's an engaged form of scholarship and it's often the case that you have people who are engaged as scholars with the identity politics of the gay and lesbian movement or various anti-racist groups who see in fans and fan communities forms of anti-hegemonic resistance to hegemonic forms of power. It's engaged. It's scholars who are on the side and fighting for, as they see it, the groups of fans that they study. All of that is not cultural sociology. Sorry to disappoint you, but it's not. What is then um, cultural sociology? It's got some overlaps with that, but it's not that. Cultural sociology in the widest sense is what I try to represent and embody in the journal Cultural Sociology. In the widest sense, cultural sociology is any engagement with culture that is recognisably sociological. So, in effect, what's the definition of cultural sociology that I operate with? It's when cultural stuff is looked at in some sort of sociological way and not a typically cultural studies way. In this widest sense, there are two main dimensions of cultural sociology. First, the sociology of conventionally cultural phenomena. And secondly, the sociology of the cultural dimensions of any aspect or sphere of human life. So the first dimension is, cultural sociology is when we study sociologically stuff that people think is culture. Stuff like the media, stuff like music, stuff like the opera, stuff like museums. So the first aspect of cultural sociology is using sociology to look at things that everybody could agree were cultural. However, the second dimension of cultural sociology is the sociology of the cultural dimensions of any aspect or sphere of human life. On the second understanding of cultural sociology, cultural sociology can be applied to anything, any aspect of human existence. There can be a cultural sociology of health, a cultural sociology of politics, a cultural sociology of religion, a cultural sociology of this, that and the other. Because here on the second definition, what cultural sociology is, <coughs> is that it is a particular way of thinking, conceiving, and researching that can be applied to any dimension of society. The two dimensions, then, of cultural sociology are the two bits that make up the field today, and the journal represents the field because it publishes work from both these two dimensions. So to take the sociology of conventionally cultural phenomena first, so this is when people study sociologically things that everybody could agree were cultural, like music, opera, media, and so on. That kind of cultural sociology tends to involve conventional sociological theory and methods. In other words, standard theories and standard methods drawn from wider sociology are applied to conventionally cultural phenomena. Now, so that means that you just take standard sociological theory and research methods and apply it to opera, apply it to music or, or whatever. But although I'm saying that the theory and the methods are conventional, there are multiple claims made by the people that do that kind of cultural sociology to be innovative. And the main innovations in the field at the moment tend to be statistical. People are thinking of ever fancier statistical means of understanding things like museum attendance. So, Sociology, a conventional sociology looking at cultural things, that is called 
by the people who do it, the sociology of culture. So here's the great confusion. Some people are doing that kind of thing. It's a particular approach, but that particular approach is just one approach within broader cultural sociology, if you see what I mean. The UK version of sociology of culture is very much Bourdieu inspired. So if you're a British sociologist of culture, you'll use standard Bourdieuian theory and research methods to go and find out how many people go to certain kinds of museums, or how many people go to the opera, and so on. In the US version of the sociology of culture, it is the case that the sociology done there is very quantitative, lots and lots of numbers, and it particularly focuses on the culture industries. So American sociology of culture would very much study, for example, a Hollywood studio or something like HBO making television programs and would study the production processes inside a particular organization. So the British do Bourdieu and the Americans do cultural industries with lots and lots of numbers. That is conventional sociology of culture. Turning now to the other dimension, though, the sociology of the cultural dimensions of any aspect of human life, this is the other kind of cultural sociology. This is what you could call cultural sociology proper. This kind of sociology tends to use more unconventional theory and methods. It's not so beholden to the standard sociological canon of great theories and great thinkers. <coughs> Indeed, this kind of cultural sociology takes ideas generally drawn from the humanities and from cultural theory and in terms of its methods, instead of using statistics and things like that, very much favours hermeneutic methods of reading cultural forms rather than counting stuff up. So this is cultural sociology in what I'm going to call the more specific sense. This is cultural sociology as it's practiced by the so-called Yale School, led by Jeffrey Alexander, whom I believe was at UCD quite recently, and cognate projects like that. So you get sociology of culture on the one hand, and then cultural sociology in the more specific sense on the other. You put those two things together and you get the overall field of cultural sociology. And that's where we are at the present time. <coughs> So the field works rather like that. You have a bigger dimension represented by Schwarzenegger, that's sociology of culture, and then you have a smaller but more unusual cultural sociology represented by Danny Dean. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's <laughs> but cultural studies. But never mind. Anyway, so you have sociology of culture, Schwarzenegger, plus cultural sociology in a specific sense, Danny DeVito. And it comes as no surprise that number one, sociology of culture, is much more strongly institutionalized. As many more departments do it, it appears in mainstream journals. Sociology of culture, in the way the Americans do it, appears in the mainstream American journals, like American Sociological Review and the American Journal of Sociology. How do you get into those? You put in lots and lots of statistics. So this is very much institutionalized sociology, number one, sociology of culture. It's institutionalized because it's institutionalizable. It works like sociology on an orthodox definition. Cultural sociology in the specific sense, the Alexander Yale School stuff and things like that, is less institutionalizable because it's a bit more avant-garde. It looks less like what conventional sociology is thought to be. Anyway, so you have the two dimensions of the field, those two things. They share certain ideas. There are some shared inheritances from classical sociology that both wings of the field draw upon. So, both wings of the field would take up, adapt, and use ideas such as these. Kant on mental classifications, Hegel on alienation and dialectics, Durkheim on collective classifications, Saussure on the shaping power of language and signs, Marx on ideology and its relationship to social structure, Nietzsche on the will to power, Weber on rationalization and elective affinities, elective affinities which is to say special relationships between particular types of people and particular types of things. I like X because I am a type of person in a group that likes that kind of thing. 
both kinds of cultural sociology very much draw on people also like Veblen on consumption and Mannheim on the interplay of culture and society. So there's a shared stock of knowledge that both wings of the field draw upon, but they draw upon them in notably different ways. The two wings of the field, however, also have some major divergences between them. Standard sociology of culture, the more conventional stuff, and by conventional I don't mean to put that in a negative way, I mean it conventional in a sense that it's more institutionalised. Conventional sociology of culture very much uh, has an affinity with the later structural Marx, and very much is of the view of following Marx and doubting them that social structure generates ideology. So you have society creates culture. Cultural sociology on the more specific understanding, the Yale School and Alexander and those kind of people, very suspicious of Marx. So there really is, in one way, a major bifurcation in the field as to attitudes towards Marx. Sociology of culture draws upon Durkheim on how social structures produce collective classifications. But by contrast, cultural sociology in the more specific sense reads Durkheim in a very different way. If you're a cultural sociologist in a more specific sense, then you don't talk about how social structure creates collective classifications. Instead, you talk about, and this is their key word, the autonomous power of classifications. In other words, culture is not reducible to society and forms of social power. Culture is autonomous. So in the, this reading of Durkheim, what we look at is not how society produces culture, but rather what we look at are the internal structure of classifications. We look at cultural forms in and of themselves and look at their internal structures. Not how society creates culture, but how culture is a thing in and of itself. Finally, there's a major bifurcation between the two styles of sociology because sociology of culture very much is in the, in the Enlightenment tradition of using quote-unquote scientific methods, methods that supposedly get at the pure truth of things, Whereas cultural sociology in the specific sense very much is located in romanticism and the post-romantic trend over the last 200 years that you find in the humanities. Cultural sociology in the specific sense doesn't use scientific methods as it were, it uses methods drawn from the humanities, in particular hermeneutics and the reading of cultural forms. So if you like, at the root of the bifurcation in the field today is this enduring split between the sciences and the humanities, between enlightenment and romanticism. So, as I said, this more conventional sociology of culture uses standard theories and methods drawn from mainstream sociology. What it analyzes for cultural production and distribution, how stuff's made, how it's distributed, for example, how Hollywood cinema is made within a Hollywood studio, and then how it gets distributed through chains of cinemas throughout the world. This standard sociology of culture also looks at cultural consumption and is very much inspired by Bourdieu's account of how culture is consumed on class-based lines. Finally, what this conventional sociology of culture particularly likes to do is to analyse the relations that pertain, as it sees it, between cultural forms and types of social power. So, for example, standard sociology of culture would say, let's look at opera, it's consumed by upper class people with high cultural capital, let's look at how people with low cultural capital are in effect excluded from the world of opera audiences. Cultural forms and social power then is a major thematic of this kind of sociology. This conventional sociology of culture places a strong emphasis on methodology. In that sense, it reflects the broader dispositions of sociology in general. The kind of people that do sociology of culture in this sense are very, very much methodologically driven. That reflects the strong connection of the sociology of culture the broader sociology with its own methodological preoccupations and the strong connection of this kind of sociology of culture to specific sociological subfields. This kind of sociology of culture is very close to and informs such sociological subfields as the sociology of work and industry and the sociology of stratification. So if you do produce style stuff, you use standard sociological methods, then you are connecting with 
things like standard stratification studies and standard studies of work in industry. Hence the emphasis <coughs> on methodology. And it's that emphasis on methodology that places the sociology of culture very far away from cultural studies. It's the methodological element that differentiates the sociology of culture approach from a cultural studies approach. Burrowing further down into this conventional sociology of culture, there are two major streams within it. So here we're looking at the sociology of culture dimension. Within it, there are two further entities. One is what is called American production of culture sociology, and the second is Bourdieu and Bourdieusianism. So these are the two major aspects of the sociology of culture. The American production of culture, or as I've shortened it, POC school, is primarily US-based, hence it's an American approach, and it has been developed from the early 1970s onwards. The major figures that pioneered it and are still associated with the production of culture approach are Richard Peterson, Paul DiMaggio, Paul Hirsch, Wendy Griswold, and Diana Crane. And it is noticeable that a lot of these people started off as sociologists of work and organizations and then used the ideas and methods from the sociology of work and organizations to study how culture is produced in industrial settings. So this is very much a sociology of work and industry influenced and inspired kind of sociology. Production of culture's claims can be summarized in this way. We should look at culture in the manner of the sociology of organizations. Because most culture today is made by large-scale capitalist organizations, Hollywood film studios, large publishing companies, and so on. Culture is made in cultural industries, in other words, is what they're saying. Most culture today is made industrially. You can see there that this is a modern version of what Adorno and Horkheimer claimed back in the 40s. But this is shorn, this approach, of Adorno and Horkheimer's critical theory and Marx's dispositions. It's Adorno and Horkheimer without the Marxism. And the, the assumption of the production of culture school is that cultural industries can be analysed like any other industry. There is no intrinsic difference between making cars and making films, making refrigerators and making books. It's all industrial production. But their bigger claim is this. The industrial structures of media organisations profoundly or wholly shape which sorts of cultural products get made. In other words, our world is filled with the films, books, magazines, and so on, and the kinds of books, films, magazines, and so on that get made can be traced to how particular industries are organized. If industries were organized in a different way, we'd have a radically different culture. So therefore, innovations in culture must be explained in light of industrial changes. New kinds of culture don't appear by magic. New kinds of culture appear when cultural industries change in terms of their internal organization. So the most famous paper that was put forward from the production of culture perspective was put forward by Richard Peterson in the mid-1970s, and it's called Why 1955? It's a production of culture approach to analyzing why rock and roll music suddenly took off, not in 1951, not in 1959, but in 1955. What was it about 1955 that suddenly, apparently out of nowhere, people like Bill Haley and Elvis Presley appear in the scene? And the answer, according to the production of culture perspective, is this. Rock and roll music develops in the mid-50s, mostly due to changes in the American music industry's organizational structure. So the kids went crazy for Elvis and Bill Haley and the Big Bopper, not because these guys were coming out of the blue, but only because the internal organization of two things changed. American record companies and American radio stations. There were major internal reorganizations in both those industries, and it was that that produced rock and roll and created the boom that has been with us in some way ever since. Teen culture is a product of internal changes within radio stations and record companies. That is the provocative claim. In his later work, 
Peterson formalized what the production of culture was saying. And in a paper written with his colleague Yan in 2004, he sums things up nicely. He says, if you want to understand culture today, you must understand how it's made. In order to understand how it's made, you have to look at the internal organizations of media companies. And you look at six dimensions of media companies. You look at the technology they use, the laws and regulations that they're subjected to by government. You look at the industry structure, as in, is it lots of big companies, lots of little companies? Uh, is it oligopolies or is there competition? The organization structure within particular companies. The nature of occupational careers, what kind of careers are possible within companies. And finally, the broader market, and in particular, how companies construct a market. You put those six things together, and that allows you to see what pro cultural products get made and what gets consumed in wider society. So in other words, if you want to understand culture, look at who's making it. That's where the action is. This is the dominant approach in American sociology of culture today. It is a huge industry in itself, with lots and lots of people researching in it, teaching in it, uh, PhD students by the bucket load. And yet, it has all sorts of problems that other kinds of cultural sociology fired at it. Production of culture's problems, in terms of how it analyzes things, are said by its critics to involve all sorts of factors that you can guess yourself. It's very economics driven, it's all about eco economic things, it's about industry, production, profit, and so on. It's all about endogenous analysis. It says, if you want to understand stuff, look at what goes on within cultural industries. So it's very much about going inside a company and explaining everything with reference to internal workings of a company. But that assumes that production drives everything else. It assumes that the consumption of records, films, or whatever is a reflex of production. So this sort of seems like a funny kind of Marxism, but without the Marxism. Production is all, and that's what the critics don't like about this approach. In other words, it's far too deterministic. It also gets attacked from Europe by being very American. Why? Because it reflects broader American sociology. If you read a production of culture paper, you will see that it's very concentrated on economics and very much fixated on statistics. And there's a legitimation issue there. Let's put it provocatively. In America, if you want to look like a proper sociological scientist, then you've got to make your paper look scientific. And that means using lots and lots of numbers to make it look as if it's proper science. So the more European critical theory tradition does not like the production of culture perspective because it sees it as too beholden to problematic aspects of broader American sociology. The Europeans also don't like it very much because they see it as untheoretical. They see it as descriptive, not analytical. Things are described, but not actually analyzed. It is true, however, that production of culture sometimes makes some genuflection to theory, and the two theorists that production of culture people will mention are Howard Becker on the one hand and Bourdieu on the other. But the major gripe that the Europeans have with the production of culture perspective is that it is not, in their view, critical. Because, say the Europeans, arguably all critical sociology has to make a fundamental distinction. A distinction between autonomous and free cultural production on the one hand and heteronymous constrained cultural production on the other. In other words, if you're doing sociology critically, you have to, you have to analyze to what degree are things like capitalism and the government forcing people to make things in certain ways. That is precisely what production of culture is alleged not to look at. Therefore, it's uncritical. Therefore, it's descriptive. Therefore, it's ideological. So within standard sociology culture, there's the production of culture approach with various problems and flaws. The other aspect of standard sociology culture is Bourdieu. Bourdieu and his account of class-based consumption. 
Now, as you know, the most famous work of Bourdieu, which really events the whole industry of analyzing consumption in a class-based way, is La Distinction from 1979. But other major works by Bourdieu in the sociology of culture included the uh, collection of essays, The Field of Cultural Production, and the book about people attending museums and art galleries, The Love of Art. I cannot overemphasize just how influential these books of Bourdieu have been and continue to be. It is quite an extraordinary legacy that Bourdieu left in this field, because so much of the field remains beholden to him. Now, if you wanted to put Bourdieu in a nutshell, then you would say, well, for Pierre Bourdieu, the whole world is explicable in terms of his key concepts. Bourdieu puts forward a theoretical position that basically claims to explain the whole world. And therefore, the whole world and all of culture and all of society are explicable in terms of the concepts that everybody knows. Habitus, capital, field, games, illusio of the games, misrecognition. You put those several concepts together, and when you read Bourdieu, he seems to be suggesting, look at everything in that light, and everything will become clear. This is how the world works. Now, as you know, Bourdieu was famous for creating maps of what he called social space. He analyzed fields. And the whole of Bourdieuian sociology is about producing a map of a field that can be drawn using statistical <coughs> data using a particular kind of approach to statistics called multiple correspondence analysis. Multiple correspondence analysis allows you to draw maps like that one at the top right there. And that is a map of a field, a field of cultural production, or a field of cultural consumption. So you use statistics to draw a map. Then you can back the map up by using stuff like qualitative interview data and other qualitative methods. These methods were put by Bourdieu in order to look at primarily class-based patterns of consumption that he claimed that are indubitable social facts. Whether we like it or not, consumption is socially patterned, highly stratified, and completely class-based. That is just the truth. Those patterns of consumption are mostly unknown to most individuals, People read their books, read their magazines, read their newspapers, watch their films, and do everything in their cultural lives. And what they don't realize is that that is reproducing class-based inequalities and social stratification. The patterns of consumption reproduce stratification, but most people are unaware of it, and it's only the sociologist equipped with particular concepts and methods that can see what goes on beneath the surface. So Bourdieu was able to produce, using the sophisticated statistical techniques that he did, maps like that. And so there we are, professeur de l'université, in the top left-hand corner. So it's quite good to know where we sit in social space. That's us up there. We are, according to Bourdieu, the dominated fraction of the dominant class. That's good to know. Now, Bourdieu produced these maps, and all the maps look like this. You draw two axes, horizontal and vertical. So a field of cultural production, a, let's say the field of cinema, can be understand, understood by drawing a map like that with two axes. And you place at the top of the uh, vertical axis people with high capital in that field, and people at the bottom of the axis, bottom of the axis, people with low capital. On the right, you have stuff aimed at a mass audience, and on the left, stuff aimed at a small audience. So what you get is, if we're looking at the field of film production, you can understand how films are made by drawing a map, and the map that you get allows you to plot where different kinds of producers are. So in the bottom right, you have Hollywood blockbuster directors, who have low capital but aim at a mass audience. And then, let's say at the top left, you have art house directors who have high capital in this field and are aiming at a small audience. So if you're an orthodox Bourdieusian, this tells you everything you need to, to know about what happens in the world of cinema. Now, people are increasingly very dissatisfied with what Bourdieu 
We're due to still a hegemonic figure in the field, but people increasingly don't buy a lot of what he said. Most of the action today is about criticising Bourdieu, in fact. Why? He claimed that consumption is class-based almost exclusively. Well, people today say his account of consumption is far too deterministic. The critique of Bourdieu that is said again and again and again in the present day is that habitus does not completely shape all consumption, as Bourdieu claimed. Bourdieu is said to think that habitus cannot be changed from early childhood onwards. In other words, what you consume is dictated very much in early childhood. You consume your cultural life is completely dictated by who your parents were. And Bourdieu is taken to say that tastes are rarely consciously thought about. We have tastes that are so ingrained in us there's nothing we can do to change them. The critics, and there are many, many, many critics, say quite the opposite to what Bourdieu is seen to be saying. Because the critics of Bourdieu in the present day say, no, consumption's nothing like that at all. Consumption can be creative. Consumption can be socially subversive. When people reject Bourdieu, they tend to reject not just elements of what he was saying, but Bourdieu in total. One of the major criticisms that's put forward in the present day is that Bourdieu's account of cultural consumption is false and universal and far too context specific. Why? Because he thought these ideas up in the context of Parisian society in the 1960s and 1970s. Yes, that was a highly stratified society where consumption was primarily class-based. But the critics say that his model, so based on Parisian practices of the 60s and 70s, is now wholly outdated. I'm going to skip this. It's also the case that what you said about cultural production is subjected to a tremendous amount of critique in the present day too. One of the major critics is the American sociologist the great American sociologist Howard Becker, famous for his 1963 book Deviance. In the restricted little field of the sociology of art, you basically get two choices today. You can be a Beckerian or a Bourgeoisian. According to Becker, Bourdieu got it seriously wrong when he looked at cultural production. Becker says, we shouldn't look at cultural production in terms of Bourdieu's idea of fields, but we should work with the much looser and more flexible notion of art worlds. Art worlds are more open and fluid than Bourdieu's fields, is Becker's point. Becker, as you probably know, is a practicing jazz musician. And he finds Bourdieu's account of how culture is made completely, uh, completely uh, naive because Becker is thinking, no, culture isn't made in terms of these maps and these fields and so on. Culture is made much more like guys playing improvised jazz in a group. The way that things are made culturally is open and fluid. And what we should do is use ethnographic observation of producers in action. We should look empirically at how cultural producers actually make stuff rather than draw these rather silly abstract maps. So in a recent book called Art from Start to Finish, Becker set out a new way of looking at cultural production. He said, processes of production are always open, dependent on context, and highly complex. In other words, the way stuff is made is more like guys improvising jazz than the rigid, wholly determined way of producing things that Bourdieu seems to suggest. Becker's point is this, production's always open-ended. The product at the start can be very different from the finished version. So the film was supposed to look like this, but they made it and it ended up very, very different. The process of production was contingent and open and fluid. So therefore, when people make cultural things, it's never a direct expression of habitus or their position in the field, which is what Bourdieu is taken to be asserting. Things are much more open and flexible than Bourdieu's overly restrictive ideas can admit. Okay. Okay. So, I'm going to now 
we move towards the final part of my presentation, some new stuff. So far, I've said there is two major dimensions of the field of cultural sociology. Sociology of culture and cultural sociology in the more specific sense. Sociology of culture is production of culture and virtue. Those things have been dominant for the last 15 years or so. But the field is changing. New things are happening. New approaches are appearing. And if you wanted to summarize what those new approaches are, you could summarize them in these words here. There are new foci and approaches emerging which emphasize human agency, the pragmatism of social life, the contextual nature of all action, the power of objects, and the power of performances. A lot of this stuff is coming out of France. In, in effect, but apart from Geoffrey Alexander and his school, most of the new stuff is French. For some reason, it's the French that are still able to think up new stuff, the Anglo-Saxons a lot less. So, for example, one major new thing in cultural sociology is the work of the eminent French sociologist Luc Boltanski. And as you'll know, he wrote a, a book in the last 10 years that was about justifications, how people justify what they've done. Well, that approach to analysing people's justifications is now being applied to, for example, how um, auctioneers in art markets justify the value of selling a painting at a particular price. Boltanski and Teveno's work is all about the pragmatics of social life. So a new pragmatic term is developing within cultural sociology. Also coming out of France is another major critic of Beaubourdieu, namely Bernard Lahir. He is very much against the Bourdieusian idea of habitus. Habitus, allegedly for Bourdieu, is something relatively static and unchanging. You're born into the class-based habitus of your parents, and primarily all your tastes, all your actions, and all your dispositions reflect that habitus. Well, Lahir does not buy that story at all. In a book called The Plural Actor, which I think has just appeared in English, Lair's vision of contemporary social and cultural life is this. People today no longer have a single unified habitus. Why? Because the complexity of modern society is such that their people are required to work in multiple different contexts all the time. Those multiple different contexts require an individual to have and use different habituses in the plural. In other words, we have to perform habitus. And that means that we're far more reflexive about the multiple habituses that we have to inhabit than Bourdieu's account could possibly deal with. So here is an attack on the very heart of Bourdieusianism because probably the key Bourdieu concept is habitus. And here is a fellow French sociologist that's saying habitus is reflexive, habitus is performative, habitus is multiple. The other major thing that's happening today could be summarized under the heading the actor network theory or science and technology studies term or terms. In other words, to put it simply, cultural sociology is in the process of being radically transformed by ideas and approaches drawn from science and technology studies in general and actor network theory more specifically. Here the guiding line. The replacement, the putative replacement for Bourdieu is Bruno Latour. Latour rejects Bourdieu in every possible way. The way you could summarize it in a nutshell is to say that for Latour, social life is on the surface. There are no hidden depths of social life. Social life is observable. We can see it. There are not hidden forces of class, habitus, and stratification as Bourdieu alleges. We can see what's happening, because what is happening is pragmatic and contextual, not to do with historical and social forces operating behind people's backs, as Bourdieu is alleged to assume. The other major aspect of the Latourian revolution in cultural sociology is to take objects seriously. 
cultural objects, let's say that painting on the wall, are seen to be actants. In other words, Bourdieu would look at that painting and go, okay, that painting there is made by particular kinds of cultural producers located in a particular wing of a cultural field. That kind of painting will be liked by certain kinds of people with certain kinds of habitus and not liked by other kinds of people with other kinds of habitus. In other words, for Bourdieu, the painting is primarily a signifier of class distinction. A Latourian approach says that's not the way that we should look at that painting at all. That painting is an actant with the power to act upon human beings and social life. The power, the agency of cultural objects is what we should be looking at according to the Latourian position. So meaning, the meanings we have when we consume things, meaning is not a function of habitus or class. Meaning is always a negotiation between an object and an actor. The meaning of that painting is not dictated by something to do with habitus or something to do with the field of cultural production. The meaning is a negotiation between me as the actor and the painting as the actant. In other words, things are much more open, fluid, and context-based than Bourdieu would have imagined. Because the negotiation between the object and the actor is not predetermined. The negotiation is always contingent and context-specific. So here we are again, moving towards a much more pragmatist philosophy, rather than a structuralist philosophy a la Bourdieu. Okay. I'm sorry that the writing here is so small, but this gives you a good idea of what the, the actor network theoretical term is like. Latour's colleague at the Collège de Mines in Paris, Antoine Ennion, is one of the major emerging figures in the new cultural sociology. He takes Latourian ideas and applies them to culture, particularly in his case to music. His claim is we need a radically new sociological approach to culture based on actor network theory and ethnomethodology. His point is that cultural objects have what he calls affordances. That is to say, cultural objects, like the painting, have certain intrinsic properties. But those properties can only be unleashed by human actors. In other words, that painting can do things, but it will only do things if I unleash them in my negotiation with it. The upshot of that is that the whole sociology of culture will have to be changed radically. Why? Because we'll have to replace the idea of tastes, a Bourdieu'sian idea, with a new idea, processes of tasting. So we don't look at tastes, we look at tasting as an activity. And who does the tasting? In the French, Ennion calls the people who do the tasting amateurs. Amateurs in English means a non-professional, but amateurs in French means someone who wants a particular thing. An amateur of wine, an amateur of Wagner, an amateur of some particular kind of cookery. That's who we should be looking at. The people who are loving a particular set of cultural objects. Let's look at their tasting activities. Not their tastes, because that's a producing idea, but their tasting. So, tasting involves assemblages. Classic Latourian idea. Assemblages are made up of three things. Human actors, cultural objects, which are actants, and thirdly, ancillary, that is to say, additional objects, which anyone calls devices. So I'll give you an example. You've got human actor, that's me. You've got cultural objects that are actants, that's a particular piece of music I'm listening to. And the device is my iPod or my, uh, uh, some other audio system. <coughs> Ennion's point is that when you look at tasting rather than tastes, you see that the amateurs and the actants, the people and the cultural objects, co-produce each other. In other words, taste is never predetermined. We don't just have tastes. We don't have tastes that are ingrained in our habitus. Tastes are made and remade by us all the time in specific contexts in pragmatic ways in assemblages of objects and people. We must look at these 
processes of tasting empirically using detailed micro-level data in a manner that an ethnomethodologist would collect. We must examine also what amateurs themselves think and feel about their tasting processes. People are not dupes. People are not puppets of habitus. People are reflexive, conscious, creative, and above all, able to reflect on their tasting practices and thus to alter them. Then this then becomes a radical reframing of what it is to look at the social dimensions of culture. For Bourdieu, the social is behind the scenes. The social is habitus, class, social stratification. For Ennion and for Latourians, the social is something different. Why? These amateurs know that their tastes are partly socially formed. The amateurs, if you ask them in an interview,
people say, yeah, of course I like that kind of music, because my parents listened to it, and we were very working class. They know that their tastes are partly socially determined. They know it. Therefore, they can control for that to some degree and change it. The amateurs discuss this state of affairs amongst other tasters. Therefore, amateurs, according to Ennio, are constantly testing and changing their tastes. Tastes, therefore, are produced by social groups, but not behind the backs of people, as Bourdieu alleges, but on the surface. We are constantly creating and recreating our tastes by talking to other people that like the kinds of things we like. It's a different understanding of the social. The social is not hiding, dictating what's happening. The social is on the surface. And that is the actor network theoretical attempted revolution of general sociology, and now more specifically, cultural sociology. I'm now going to miss that and draw to a close by finally just pointing out the Yale School. The Yale School, led by Jeffrey Alexander, I said, is cultural sociology in a specific sense. The Yale School doesn't like a lot of stuff. The Yale School rejects standard sociology of culture and therefore is a rebellion within American sociology against American sociology. It rejects the sociology of culture, both its theories and its methods. It rejects Bourdieu, and above all, it rejects the production of culture approach, which it sees as hopelessly flawed. According to the Yale School, all of these positions, allegedly according to Yale, see culture as a simple product of social structure. In other words, society produces culture, and that's it. And what the Yale School also doesn't like is a kind of sociology that says all culture is simply produced by powerful groups or works in their interests. Instead, the key word is autonomy. For the Yale School, culture is autonomous. It's not produced by society so much as culture has the power to shape society. Culture shapes social structure, not the other way around. And that claim about the autonomy of culture, about culture's power to change the social rather than to be controlled by the social, draws upon two key resources. A certain reading of Durkheim's Elementary Forms and drawing upon Clifford Geertz's Anthropological Hermeneutics. So these are very different theoretical resources from standard American sociology and what it uses. The Yale School particularly focus on the American civil sphere's values. So what they do is essentially a kind of Durkheimian analysis. They say the American civil sphere is made up of a culture that is split into dyads. The American civil sphere is split up into dyads such as the constitutional and the unconstitutional, the legal and the illegal, freedom versus slavery, and so on. These binary oppositions. That is American civil culture. These values structure American society. It's culture that structures the society, not society that structures the culture. Now that is a very important distinction because the Yale School say we have to completely reconceptualize what we mean by power. They admit that these American values, the civil sphere's values, can be used by powerful groups in their own interests. So clearly, some nasties like Romney and the Republicans can claim that they are all about freedom when actually they're enslaving everybody else. The values can be used by bad people. But Alexander's point is this. The less powerful can use the values for their purposes too, because culture is autonomous. Culture is about ideals. Ideals that the less powerful can use in order to transform society. And the example that he puts at the forefront of what he's talking about is the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King explicitly told America, you've got a constitution that says there shouldn't be people treated like slaves. Current society treats us like slaves, therefore current society will have to be changed. How will it be changed? Through drawing upon the power of culture, the power of the American civil sphere and its dyadic values of legality, constitutionality, freedom and so on. Culture is autonomous. Culture can reshape society for the better. 
that essentially is Alexander's cultural sociology, his cultural sociology is definitely voting Democrat in November. Finally, you can also say that the Alexander people in Yale School are doing two other things. They're also trying to make cultural sociology take a narrative turn. They are taking ideas here from literary studies. Again, taking stuff from outside of sociology in an attempt to transform sociology from within. The narrative turn involves a claim that says social events are always narrated through standardized stories. So when people talk about anything, they always frame it in terms of fables. Fables, narratives, that always involve heroes, villains, victims. The heroes face particular challenges. The heroes engage in heroic action. And eventually the heroes will triumph or experience failure, and that is what is a social tragedy. Think about how 9-11 is talked about by Americans in terms of the good guys and the bad guys, in terms of the heroic struggle of the American people against the forces of evil and so on. Well, we can analyze 9-11 using these narrative methods in a new narrative literary sociology. Finally, the Alexander people are also attempting to engage the wider field in a performance term, which is a kind of souped up version of Goffman, whereby we look at how social life is essentially a series of theatrical performances, not in the Goffman sense of I'm acting to you and you're acting to me, but in terms of how actors are like stage directors, putting on theatrical performances using forms of direction, mise-en-scene and so on, in order to produce certain effects in others. So the performance turn is basically saying, let us look at life as theatre. Again, a very humanities approach a new way, as they see it, of studying things sociologically. And the new approaches have all sorts of problems. To finish up, I'll tell you the two problems. All this stuff from Ennion and the others about agency, about pragmatics, about testing and tasting and so on, well, there's a lot of agency there, but not very well connected is that agency to macro factors. In other words, we're looking at micro contexts but not looking at the broader picture. The very issues and themes that Purdue was good at, class, stratification, broader macro level forms of power and so on. So people are looking at agency in micro level contexts but they haven't really worked out yet how to yoke that to macro level concerns. And that's clearly a huge problem for any sociological project. Secondly, the Yale School is criticizable and has been criticized in many ways for basically assuming that culture is autonomous of society. The critics of Alexander and the Yale School say the idea of culture's autonomy is in the Alexander position a rigid assumption, a naive assumption. How could culture be completely autonomous of society? It's impossible. Yes, it may be partly autonomous, but society influences culture just as culture influences society. So, there's all this new stuff, but there's some very obvious problems with it, and the next step is to sort out the problems and come to more satisfactory, synthetic, more totalizing positions. And that's how I'm going to end, because what happens next? Or, what is to be done? Well, I think that if I had to summarize very briefly where cultural sociology is going in the next five to ten years. I can both describe what's happening but also give some evaluation as to what should happen. The first thing is I think that there is a lot of really quite silly Bourdieu bashing going on and we need to get beyond it. It's a reaction against a formerly powerful and hegemonic figure. When people say that Bourdieu's sociology is not convincing, they risk throwing out all its good aspects. All the beneficial aspects of Bourdieu are in danger of being forgotten. So we have to get, get beyond a far too negative appreciation of Bourdieu. That means that there should be more synthesizing and less opposing. The rather, and I'll, I'll put it very bluntly, the rather childish aspect of the field of cultural sociology at the moment is that the different schools of thought all attack each other and they all think they're in the right. They're not attempting to take different positions and put them together in productive ways. 
It's essentially, I'm right, you're wrong, and it's not a very helpful current state of play. And that means that I think that we have to get beyond attempted hegemonies. And what I mean by that is that all the different positions that are in the field at the present day, they're all trying to say our definition of culture is the right one. Our way is the right way. But that is not really a good idea because what people should do is recognize that different accounts of society and culture are for different purposes and address different phenomena. Nobody has the last word. Nobody can say my defini defini definition of culture, my approach is the right one. Clearly Bourdieu was right to look at certain things in certain ways. Clearly Alexander is right to look at other things in certain ways. But nobody can say that they've got the whole truth. All the different positions are trying to become the dominant ones in the field. It would be far better if they made more modest claims, just got on with their own doings and said, I respect these other positions because these other positions are doing different things and studying other stuff, stuff that we don't look at. I'll, I'll forget what I'm going The ANTSTS term should be taken thoughtfully. It's good, it's interesting, all that any old stuff and stuff about actants and objects. But there is a danger that people are being so enthusiastic about it, it's being taken up uncritically and in ways that means that it's going to look rather overstated very soon. In other words, people are being far too enthusiastic about Latour and far too negative about Bourdieu. We need a calmer appreciation of these great sociologists. Be less beholden to Parisians might be quite a good idea because all the new ideas seem to be coming from Paris and most of those ideas are very good and very interesting, but it would be nice to have some ideas coming from some other places as well. So I'm a bit tired of the latest Parisian fashions coming in and everybody jumps in the bandwagon and then another one comes in and they jump in that bandwagon. It's getting a bit silly. So let's, let's be less beholden to Parisians and take people from other parts of the world more seriously. There is interesting stuff out there that doesn't really get attended to. And finally, and this is always how I look at it, and I'll close on a personal note. How you do your cultural sociology seems very much to depend on what kind of culture that you like. Any old, when he's talking about his testing and tasting, is very much thinking about his own experiences with wine tasting and listening to certain kinds of music. He clearly loves those things, so the sociology is a very positive one. Burgesians, on the other hand, are much more distanced from the kinds of things they talk about and they're quite prepared to say music isn't a wonderful thing, music can be a form of class power and distinction and social stratification. So most people who write in the Berjusian vein probably aren't music lovers in the way that anyone is. What I'd like to see is people engage in more reflexive self-examination because the kinds of sociology they do seems to very much reflect what kinds of things they like and don't like culturally. In other words, in a hidden and tacit way, a person's cultural consumption patterns often dictate the kind of sociology they engage in. And it's not good enough that that remains unreflexive. It's not good enough that that relationship remains unthought. We should be much more clear about why what we like drives what kinds of styles of sociology we engage in. So that's the state of play in the field. Big problems, lots of interesting stuff going on. It's a field that even if it's not your field, is worth attending to some of the ideas in, perhaps. I think that some of the ideas, for example, in the cultural sociology now being done by active network theorists could very usefully be applied to the sociology of work, the sociology of health, and so on. There's all sorts of interesting things going on. But whether those new ideas escape from the field of cultural sociology and move out to other fields is, of course, a matter of that I have no idea what will happen. And it's in that modest note that I'll thank you for listening. Okay, thank you of thoughts here. I see three fingers going up for you, sir. Yeah, um, I suppose, yeah, I, 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 I
Um, perhaps I want to come to the to the defence board in certain ways, but um, the way he's on the inhabitants there to represent the determinist I mean these these are the inhabitants it's shaped they're the right but it's you know there's accretion and it changes all the fields of the nurse. Uh, secondly I think Borgia is very associated with culture it, Again, uh, you mentioned this at the end, but he, his research questions are very broad, and people just take it, they take him according to their own perspective. I mean, I'm reading his, uh, for example, his work on law, the field of law. He looks at hermeneutics and meaning something that Alexander accuses him of not doing. Yeah. He looks at that, and, because his, his research question is close to Gramsci's here on social domination and how it takes place and how it, uh, it continues in various forms of society. And also, again, his study of distinction takes place in the 60s. He's admitted that he's based it on the empirical evidence that he had in the 60s, but again, in the preference to the Japanese edition. He says, you know, you can't look at Japan using the same things I have. Yeah. It's much more flexible and open. But, so Borges, he's read as a structuralist almost, a deterministic structuralist. But there is an phenomenological aspect to him. He's always said that. You just read Cicero, who's very sympathetic to his work. Yeah. Uh, and that move towards ethnomethodology uh, has come back from the tour. Uh, you know, Barry Barnes had said that it was very influential in doing all this. But, no, but Borgia tries to, does try to balance those movements, but he doesn't get it right sometimes. But it again depends on the empirical form we're looking at. So that's all I want to say. Yeah, can you my example of the question? Or? Um, Oh, yeah. It's better before I forget. <laughs> My responses will be better if I do it immediately. Uh, well, I couldn't agree more because what I've been doing here is representing what the people who are attacking yeah. Virtue say about him. And yeah, there's every caricature in the world going on, and a, a lot of Virtue is just completely ignored or trashed. And it's unfortunate. The phenomenological Virtue, or the existential Virtue, is completely forgotten in all these criticisms. But there is a Bourdieu that is totally based in Merleau Ponty phenomenology, right. practical consciousness, and so on. And it's a very interesting Bourdieu. And it reflects but, the Bourdieu as well. But, but I think that we can say that Bourdieu was such a major figure that it's bound to be that there's so many different dimensions of his work. People will, for their own purposes, either willfully or unintentionally, focus on certain things mm -hmm. and not others. But the problem with Bourdieu, I think, is that he puts together all these different things and some of them mesh together and some of them don't. And so, to put it very crudely, the phenomenological Bourdieu and the structural Bourdieu are two different Bourdieu's and they don't fit together completely. Or, at least you can say, there's different ways of reading Bourdieu. But, the people who criticise them read them very, very negatively and unfairly. Okay guys, can we have a short question? Not, you know, long statements, precise. Hard to do. Yes. Um, thank you, Ray. I said that I'm afraid I'm just saying a question you all know and can get to most of it. But I'm very struck by the fact that there's almost no mention of anthropology. I consider Bourdieu, for example, as much an anthropologist as a, yeah. as a sociologist. What strikes me is that the, this discussion you're talking about in terms of the social analysis within anthropology. We have this kind of split between kind of European anthropology, mm -hmm. which is structures and relationships and so on, and American traditional American anthropology, sometimes called well, mostly called cultural anthropology as opposed to social anthropology. And there's a kind of murdering thing happening there. And from, to put it in a nutshell, what I what I'm getting from this is this this the last point you make, this idea of being reflexive from the start, I think is important because mm -hmm. a, it seems to me a solid definition for example, of culture is needed, albeit bad, most definitely are bad definitions in any case. But the point about this is that you have, if you like, Western modernist um, ethno-centric interpretations of events, and uh, you're in danger then of, of, of putting forward models which uh, we get like, we on the for everything. So what you've talked about in terms of the Parisian model was almost a, po a, a post promo model, actually. Uh, and I, I can feel the person in the back of my neck go up as you started. And I completely agree with, with Stephen in relation to Bourdieu. He cannot be, I mean, he talks about logic and fuzzy logic, for example. Uh, I mean, that's, that's completely different to the, the sort of interpretation that, that, that seems to be abroad yeah. uh, there. You know, so 
uh, I, I would have I would have some difficulty with that. The other issue is which well, I think you could show up. Last last one, quite important is the is the, is the issue of um, agency and structure and so on. And um, you know we have we have a lot of theories out there about this, that, and the other. Social class is the big one, of course. We you can many of us talk about it within sociology, but. You know, when you have people like Pukulski and Waters talking about the death of social class or the fact that it doesn't even exist, for example, and you've got others who argue, you know, from for a completely different position, like uh, uh, um, Roy Bascar, where you don't actually have to see a social class, but you can taste it by the effects of social class, yeah. okay, what happens. I mean, it seems to me that what's accounted for within this kind of American brand of, of, of uh, cultural sociology doesn't properly account for that, or at least I haven't, I haven't got it, I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I don't want to be any comments on any of that. Yeah, I, I do. And what I'd like to do is just jump back to one slide. Yeah. And for me, So this was a slide I didn't have time to talk about, but at the bottom there, the analytical work that's going on in terms of the reappraisal of Bourdieu's uh, reputation is basically, at the moment, posing the question, are there two, at least two Bourdieu's? And on the one hand, you have Bourdieu very much influenced by Parisian forms of thought in the 60s, which is to say semiotics and semiotic structuralism, and also sociological structuralism. And on the other hand, as I was saying in response to you, you have the Bourdieu of phenomenology focused on practical consciousness, the Bourdieu of Melo Ponty, and even possibly distributed agency, a kind of thing that anthropologists talk about. And in effect, there's been quite a lot of papers written over the last five years saying Bourdieu part one is far too rooted in really quite bad Parisian thinking in the 60s, it's pretty much discredited. But Bourdieu too, which you could conventionally call the anthropological Bourdieu, is that stuff there is far more flexible, far more interesting, and a far more interesting account of habitus, far more flexible account of habitus and so on. Bourdieu oscillates between those two things, depends what work you're reading, what Bourdieu you get. If you read The Love of Art, you get Bourdieu 1, and if you read any of the general theory books, like The Logic of Practice, you get Bourdieu 2. And so what I think should happen is that if you want to retain Bourdieu's legacy within this field, then Bourdieu 2 is the way to go, because Bourdieu 1 is not very good. Um, my further and general response is, yes, sociologists should read much more anthropology. And um, what I didn't have time to mention is that cultural sociologists of various hues are taking up the ideas of Alfred Gell, who came up with a very influential theory in anthropology of how people respond to artworks, and that's leading to some quite new ideas in the sociology of art perception. And also it's the case that um, the anthropological aspect of actor network theory is very interesting. For example, the work of Anne-Marie Moll, um, and that stuff is also being taken up uh, as well, so I didn't mention that. But there, there is a, there's a some sign of an anthropological turn in cultural society. I don't think I should have brought that to that at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thanks very much. It was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I, um, um, I was just really surprised, actually, by what I felt was a very... Um, naive view from this much lauded Antoine Hignon and his use of something called actor network theory. Mm. So um, the last few years I've got quite interested in the field of social network theory and methodology. And that is a field that's been on the go of course since the nineteen thirties, starting with civil work um, and then really taking off I guess in, in about the uh, the seventies, eighties on the new this building in the last ten or fifteen years. And really they've gone through this um, you know, fascination with the structure of society and structural relationships in society, mapping out carefully the ties between the actors in your network, to then kind of um, move away from that and a strong critique about what do we what do we understand by the agency of actors in the network, to a point now where they are much more modest in the sense that the theory and the method that's being developed is very much at the meso level. It's focused on particular types of phenomena. For example, 
um, quite a very quite an interesting study of social media, but looking at smaller groups of individuals often in the sort of mainstream sociological tradition where you're trying to understand, you know, why particular um, subcultures emerge and why they're regarded as deviant and how that happens in a, in a structural sense, but also in terms of the agency of actors in the network. And that has also been matched by a really interesting set of quite careful um, methodologies that allow you to test these things. So, I mean, I have to admit, cultural sociology is something I haven't felt that I belong in, but listening to this, I think, my goodness, you know, the field of social network analysis is something that cultural sociologists, I think, could exploit enormously, because it has a kind of toolbox, you know, and cultural sociologists have lots of really interesting questions. And it is already there where the community will not accept a grand theory, a Bordeauxian theory, you know, of resources. Mm -hmm. They will always regard, you know, that resources are in many ways, yes, we're just right there, they're in some sense path dependent, but the agency of actors in a, in a particular social structure will have to be accounted for, you know, so you, people come to the table with some resources, but they also have agency. They have the ability to make new ties, they have the ability to build new resources, um, and they have the ability to create new, new fields or new arenas or new new types of network structures. So the whole idea behind social network analysis, and I think why it's become so current, is that it reflects, and I think I think that's where Henry and you know, these guys are really interesting, it reflects a you know modern society as it is in, as we have it now, a very much more lateral, laterally structured society mm. than was the case in the sixties, when you had these very strong hierarchies and um, you know, very clear divisions in society. But yeah, I, I think you know there's a big group of folk out there that I think you know they could benefit from the kind of questions cultural sociologists are asking. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And the good news is that this turn has also started, but it's very much in its infancy. It's been pioneered the use of social network analysis for the for looking at cultural production by the University of Manchester. Yeah. They're really big. I yeah. know all these guys. Yeah. yeah, right. And so people like Nick Crossley. Um, what they do is they apply the methods and ideas of social network analysis to, Edwards, yeah, to music scenes. And so it allows you to t retell, for example, the, the story of how punk appeared through really quite specific small networks. Careful people, studies. Yeah. yeah, very micro studies, yeah, yeah. but with meso-level ramifications. And we are having um, a special edition of the journal that will come out within the next 18 months where this work is presented and what I've been doing as an editor is basically trying to get the social network people not to trash Bourdieu because in the initial running papers that they sent me it was social network analysis is fabulous and Bourdieu and fields of cultural production rubbish and so I've been trying to say but all the things that Bourdieu is saying about fields of cultural production can be made to fit with what you're saying about social network analysis and you can have a synthesis so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, has been my job in terms of commenting on the papers. And you'll see that special edition out fairly soon, and I'm, I've got quite high hopes that this will be another new development that takes things in a good way. Yeah, yeah just a quick um, one. I've got a short one, which is the story of my life. Um, given what you said, and given your presentation, which I really enjoyed, I think I know the answer to this, but I can't resist it really, which is, why should we leave omnivores alone? Well, of course, because I was running out of time and I didn't want to bore you further, I didn't talk about the, the omnivore stuff, but basically, as a lot of people will know, um, consumption studies is basically obsessed with omnivores and has been since Richard Peterson thought up the idea in Critique of Bourdieu 20 years ago. So I, I suppose there's a biographical element there that if I get yet another bloody paper about omnivores sent to the journal, I might do something drastic. Um, and that's, yeah, that's personal. Leave omnivores alone because I'm sick of reading about them. But I think that the, the omnivore debate has gone on for 20 years, and after 20 years, I think that we've said everything that we probably can about omnivores. So if you get a paper about vegans, you'll publish it, yeah? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's the other side of it. I put myself uh, on, the, on the list with a short question. Um, I mean, you said it's all Parisian stuff, and you locate the beginnings somewhere, well, apart from that early forerunner. But um, <coughs> what about a few other names? I mean, uh, in Germany, uh, a couple of other 
Dr. Weber comes to mind, mm -hmm. founded a project called Kultursoziologie, which translates into concept sociology. Uh, more in the 70s and 80s, uh, there's a whole range of German sociologists who've covered that uh, slightly, di in slightly different ways, less, uh, less Verkamen than more Weberian. Uh, Mattes is one of those guys who comes to mind. Um, but also in other countries, you know, I think about.
uh, so, uh, people who done cultural uh, sociology avant la lettre, uh, Julio Caro Balfa in, in Spain. Um, yeah, 25 books, um, none of them translated. Um, it tells us also a few things on how we, you know, how we deal with other countries and other cultures. Um, and that's also applies to cultural sociology. Right? Mm. Um, Max Weber and Alfred Weber remind me rather of David Miliband and Ed Miliband, <laughs> because uh, Alfred is the, the better, smarter brother, um, and hopefully he's coming in the floor more. I, I mean, I, I think Alfred Weber's amazing. Well, there's, there's a theory of globalization in early wrote in the 20s that anticipates everything that was written in the 90s. And uh, yes, absolutely, the German-speaking world didn't come into this story. You could easily have said, well, what about Nicholas Luhmann? Because Luhmann and systems theory is very important in German-speaking sociology generally and in German-speaking cultural sociology. What the Germans mean by cultural sociology is slightly different from what the Anglo-Saxons mean, but there is some convergence in the present day. But anyway, I quite like what Luhmann says about art and so on, and there's ways in which you can fit kind of Luhmannian themes to other perspectives as well. I'd like to see more of that. But you're right, the, the, I should have narrated more about the German case. Okay, there's, I mean, there's more time to, uh, uh, to question or to get and get to, to talk to you over wine. So uh, there's uh, some wine available down in the common room. So if you just follow the main group uh, and we make our way down there. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and sharing.